All right, guys, Matthew chapter 6, and uh, we're going to read, uh, we're, I've, I, I gave you for your notes verses 1 through 2, and th- that's certainly the most important section, that's what we're going to be spending our mo- most of our time in, but um, I, he talks about rewards quite a bit in the first half of this chapter. Well, you could even say rewards are uh, what this entire chapter is about, really. Um, <clears throat> but we're going we're gonna to read a little bit more than just verses 1 and 2. So if you would start with me at verse 1, it says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Let's just keep reading. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So we've, we've definitely got this theme of reward here, and the theme is at least somewhat dependent on your motivation, okay? And the reward here is for righteous deeds, specifically sharing, giving, being generous with uh, what God has given you. But it's not, not just being generous with what God's given you. Look at verse 5. There's also reward for little things like prayer. You're walking to class, and in the secret place, in your heart, in your mind, you're walking and, and you pray and, and you worship God for whatever it is, the trees or the sky or a, a good grade or a person in your life or you ask him, whatever it is. There's also reward for small things like prayer. Read with me in verse five. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And it's not just prayer. It's not just giving. But when you give up something, even a good thing like food, you forego something like food for the glory of God. That too will receive a reward. Jump with me now to verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And I don't think Jesus is talking about earthly rewards here. I don't think he's talking about knowing him more. That's not the primary thing he's talking about because the very next verse says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is saying here that it's possible for you to lay up some kind of reward, some kind of a treasure in heaven. Now, uh, because that's kind of a, maybe a little bit of an underrepresented doctrine, let's just go through and let me prove that to you from other texts, that there is certainly a reward to be had in, in heaven, in eternal life for good deeds done here on this side. It's, it's everywhere once you start to look, once you start to see it. Matthew 10, 42, Jesus says, whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. <laughs> the smallest thing, right? One of the things that was in uh, the culture of our, when I was a college student, one of the things that was part of our culture is this was just on our minds all the time. And so I can remember there was one time a brother was uh, one of our fellow students. He was uh, preaching and halfway through the sermon, he basically said, man, I I'm, I'm, didn't grab any water. His mouth was dry, probably because he was nervous. And he said, can I get some water? And everyone just stood up and started running as fast as they could right, to, to get water, like, you know, trying to get that treasure in heaven, right? They want to give a disciple that cold cup of water. They want to uh, receive this reward. Or when we would be going on a road trip, right? We would be the first to call the worst seat in the van, 
right? Why? So that we would have more treasure in heaven. I want to give you the best seat. I want you to have the passenger seat, right? Or, you know, I laugh about this. I think this is kind of in Christian culture a little bit already, maybe subconsciously, like nobody ever eats the last piece of pizza. You know, like, how do you know you're at a Christian party? There's one piece of pizza left. That's how you know, right? We, we don't want to, you know, take that for ourselves. But, but this, I think, is something that it, it would be good. It would be wise. It would be a, a beacon to the world that you're not living for this world, that you're not just trying to get as much as you can. And, and I think one of the ways that that's developed is when you put all of your hope in eternal treasure in heaven instead of hope in this world. That leads you to a self-sacrificial lifestyle. And it's even tiny things. It's even tiny things like giving somebody a cup of cold water or giving up your seat in the van, right? Or praying for somebody and they don't even know it, Right? Or look at this. This is just profound to me. Luke 14, 12 through 14 says this. He said also to the man who had invited him, this is Jesus talking, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. <laughs> he's, just, he's saying you should kind of hope that you don't get repaid. When you share something or you do a good, kind thing, you should kind of hope in your heart secretly, man, I really hope they don't pay this back. That's, that's what he's saying. They might repay you if you invite a certain kind of people, verse 13. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. What's Jesus saying here? Uh, we live in a culture that cares a lot about justice, and, and that sh that's, that's a good thing for the Christian cause. We have a God that cares about justice more than um, probably anybody. He, he cares about justice more than you think he does. He cares about justice so much that when you have a potluck and you invite that guy that you know is going to bring a half-eaten bag of potato chips to your potluck, he's going to repay you for that at the resurrection of the just. Every single tiny thing is what he's trying to say. God has such a, an overwhelming love of justice, right? Of everything being repaid, of every good deed getting what it deserves, of, of everything working out in the end, that down to the smallest cup of water or the person you invite over to your house for dinner, it will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. God cares about justice more than we think he does. This is just everywhere in scripture, everywhere in scripture, that there is going to be a reward in heaven. And I think this is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15, when he says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. What, what this means, right, is that uh, all of your efforts from the smallest to the, to the greatest, none of them will be wasted. I think that what that should do for you, what it does for me, is it should motivate you to good deeds. It should make you a kind of people that are zealous for good works, which is the kind of people Christians ought to be. When we live by faith and not by sight, when we look forward to an unseen realm and not the realm that's here, when we store up all our treasure in heaven, we become the kind of people that are zealous for good works because we believe that God will repay every single one of those. And what this does, this teaching, this doctrine, um, is it helps us to understand all of those verses that talk about us being judged according to our deeds. Have you ever been reading the scriptures and you read something and it says, and they'll be judged according to your deeds and you go, uh-oh, <laughs> Right? Have you, that, that's where I thought I wasn't going to be judged according to my deeds. I thought, it didn't, I thought Romans was saying, you know, I, I won't be judged according to what, I'll be judged according to Christ's deeds, right? When you understand that you will be judged uh, um, not, not for your sins if you're in Christ, but for the good deeds that you've done to receive reward, all these scriptures start to come into place. They start to make sense, right? Romans 2.6 says, He will render to each one according to his works. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Revelation 20.12 says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Just one more. I don't, I don't mean to scripture bomb you, but just one more. Matthew 16, 27, for the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. So what this means is when you die, 
and the day of judgment comes, what you can expect is that you will stand before God and you will give an account for your life. And if your sin is remembered, if it is, okay, I, I'm a little unclear. If it is, it will, if you're in Christ, it will only be so that you can cast them on Christ and grow more profound love for his incredible mercy and grace that he's taken all of your sin. And all of your good deeds, every cup of cold water that you gave to someone, right? Every dollar that you spent, that person that didn't pay for the gas money to get here, and you did, it'll be remembered in heaven and you'll receive a reward for it. But for the wicked, for the unrighteous, those who do not have faith, what the scripture teaches is that uh, whatever does not come from faith is sin, right? Whatever is not from faith is sin. And when they stand before God in the judgment and they try to offer their good works, they're all just crumble in their hands. They'll realize their motivations were all wrong all the time because they weren't done to the glory of God from a love of God and a, and a love for man, but that their good deeds were done uh, similar to the Pharisees, right? Where they're maybe doing good deeds, but inwardly, motivationally, they're, they're wretched, they're wicked, and it'll crumble before them. And it'll be a terrifying moment when they realize they've rejected their only hope of salvation. They've rejected Christ. And so they will be judged according to their deeds. And you'll be judged according to your deeds, but your good deeds, your, your wicked, sinful deeds will be thrown behind God's back, buried in the bottom of the ocean, remembered no more. If they're remembered at all in that day, it'll only be to elevate the incredible grace and riches and kindness of Jesus. Okay, are we tracking? We got that? Rewards helps us understand being judged according to our deeds. And so I think a logical question to ask is, okay, Jesus, what are these rewards? Do not lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust is steel. Lay up for yourself treasure, or sorry, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. <laughs> it's the opposite of what I'm trying to say. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys. God will reward you. What are these rewards? What is this, what is this like? Um, I'm trying to think of the, the best order to do this. Let's, let's do it this order. Um, I think the good question to ask is, what will I have need of in heaven? You know, it's like, God, are you going to give me money in heaven? Like, am I going to need to buy anything? Like, what, what kind of reward am I going to get if it's not money, if it's not stuff? If I am in your glory and in your presence and with the saints and we're all worshiping you and we're perfected in holiness and happiness, what more could you possibly give me in heaven? Uh, and, and this is, this is where, let, let me just read a couple scriptures to you. Uh, our God loves justice. And the other thing our God loves is, <laughs> I'm saying this a little tongue in cheek on purpose. The other thing, but it's, it's totally true. The other thing our God loves is he loves diversity. He loves diversity. It, it, we will not all have the same glory in heaven. We will all be perfectly happy, perfectly filled, perfectly in his presence. But there are some scriptures that seem to teach that there will be varying levels of glory and reward. And even in a sense, our, our happiness will be perfect, but levels of happiness even in heaven. This is Daniel 12, uh, verse 2 and 3. It says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. It seems to me like he's saying there, there are some people that just grab onto the gospel and believes all these promises that we've been going, talking about and put all of their hope in heaven. They say, I'm gonna win souls to Christ and that's gonna be my life. And I'm gonna seek his word and grow in wisdom and live the way I ought to. And that those people will shine like the stars in heaven. And if everybody's gonna shine like that in the same way, then why say it at all? If, if, if I think him saying it indicates that there is a distinction and is that a reward. And this idea of shining, of light uh, emanating from someone like a star, that's almost always in scripture used to connotate a certain kind of glory. You know, it's just a, a, it's an image for glory. Moses comes down off of the mountain and he's shining. He's seen the glory of God and he's become like God and he's become in a sense glorious himself. And we're gonna be like that when we behold God in heaven. We're going to behold God like Moses did, but perfectly and in heaven. And some of us will shine like the stars in heaven. 
Or I think maybe even more clearly, this is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 38 says, but God gives it a body as he has chosen. He's talking about the resurrection of the dead here. And to each kind of seed, its own body. And then I'm going to jump over to 41. There is one glory of the sun and one glory of the moon. God loves diversity. And another glory of the stars. For stars differ from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. Do you see that? There are some stars in the night sky that just shine with amazing brilliance. You, you know what I mean? You, like, you just see it even before it's dark out, right? It's the only star you can see. It's shining so brightly. And there's other stars that you wouldn't be able to see if you didn't have a telescope at all, but they're there. Both have glory. Both are shining. Both are incredible, but there are different degrees of glory. Um, the, the way the saints of old, again, used to think about this is they used to think about it in terms of nearness to the throne when we're in heaven, so in Revelation, you have this image of the throne and, and a multitude upon multitude that nobody can number gathered around of every tribe and tongue and nation. Again, God loves diversity, singing to God, worshiping God, praising God. And they used to think of it as the ones closest to the throne are those that have the most glory. And there's this story that I love. I think it's, I think it's a true story. Um, I don't know if you guys knew this. John Wesley and George Whitfield were really good friends for a while. <laughs> and, and then the Ar classic Arminian Calvinist clash happened between them, and they wrote back and forth trying to convince one another. John Wesley was a staunch Arminian. George Whitfield, obviously a staunch Calvinist. Calvinist. And then uh, when George Whitfield died, apparently John Wesley preached at his funeral, and afterwards, a gal came up to him, and because they had had such intense arguments and battles and debates, and they'd kind of gone their separate ways and even made kind of different denominations, um, she, asked him, uh, she asked him this. I'll just read the quote. It says, one day after Whitfield's decease, John Wesley was timidly approached by one of the godly band of Christian sisters who had been brought under his influence and who loved both Whitfield and himself. Dear Mr. Wesley, may I ask you a question? Yes, of course, madam, by all means. But dear Mr. Wesley, I am very much afraid what the answer will be. Well, madam, let me hear your question, and then you will know my reply. At last, after not a little hesitation, the inquirer tremblingly asked, Dear Mr. Wesley, do you expect to see dear Mr. Whitfield in heaven? Right? Like, uh, that must have been a pretty intense fight if she's afraid. Like, I don't know if this guy even thinks he's saved, right? Must have been some harsh words shared there. A lengthy pause followed, after which John Wesley replied with great seriousness, no, madam. His inquirer at once exclaimed, ah, oh, I was afraid you would say so. To which John Wesley added with intense earnestness, do not misunderstand me, madam. George Whitfield was so bright a star in the firmament of God's glory and will stand so near the throne that one like me, who am less than the least, will never catch a glimpse of him. <laughs> That's just profound. Isn't that amazing? That, that was on their minds. They were living their lives thinking about that kind of thing, do we? Are we truly heavenly minded people? Are we truly thinking about the glory that's to come? They were. That seems to be what drove them to live like such crazy people. They were wholly putting their hope in heaven. And one thing that's greatly encouraging to me about this is that our God is a, is a stunningly generous God, right? Like some of the parables that he tells, especially about the minas and the talents, right? Just what they're supposed to convey to us is just an incredible generosity. Like the man that makes, uh, you know, uh, 10 minas for God, God says, okay, for those 10 minas, I'm going to give you 10 cities. That's massive generosity, right? You make someone 10 minas, which is not that much money, and they give you 10 cities, you know, he, he, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't even know what the number would be. Massive amplification in his generosity. God is not miserly. God is not limited in his resources. It's not like he's got a bank account and when he gives to you, his bank account goes down and so he's gotta be careful about how much he gives so he doesn't have too little money in the bank account. When we get to heaven, because God is infinite in his glory and infinite in his majesty, he can freely give us glory without fear of him ever running out, which means in heaven, the rewards that he gives, the reward for a cup of cold water given to somebody, 
It, it, the reward might be such a reward that we say, God, you're, you're giving me this for that? You're this shockingly generous, right? All I did was this, and you're going to give me this? This seems to be the kind of spirit that Jesus is trying to get us to understand in Matthew 25 when he says, enter into the joy of your master. And they're saying, when did we ever do anything to deserve this? When did I feed you? When did I give you a cup of cold water? When did I visit you in prison? I didn't do any of those things, right? They're shocked by Jesus's generosity. God is not miserly. He's incredibly generous. We're going to get reward in heaven for the smallest thing that we do. And the reward will be such that I think when we look back, if we have any regrets at all, it'll be that we didn't sell out more for God's kingdom. If we have any regrets at all, it'll be, man, if I would have just put this much energy, this much money, this much time into that one little thing, it would have been so incredibly valuable now. Like, I don't know how many of you guys think about the stock market. But like, it's not a very good practice to go back and like look at Tesla when it was like here. <laughs> if I would have put in $100 then, <laughs> I'd be a millionaire, right? If I would, or Bitcoin, I don't even know about, I don't know what that even is, okay? But <laughs> apparently like, man, some people are like, if I would have put in this much money then, yeah, I'd, I'd be a billionaire now. And what Jesus is saying is if you invest even this much into the kingdom of God now, you will be a billionaire in heaven, so to speak, right? He will richly reward you. It'll be massively generous. So in summary, we are often told that every man shall be judged according to his works. Christ keeps a book of remembrance of the good works of the saints as well as the sins of the ungodly. And however small or, or even polluted even our works that aren't perfectly done that the saints do, yet all the pollution that's in it, everything that we do for God that even has the least bit of sincerity is precious in God's eyes. And through his infinite grace, it shall not lose its reward in heaven. In heaven. Neither shall it in any ways lose its honor. This is a quote, this isn't me. At the day of judgment, they shall receive praise and glory and reward for it. Okay? Goal number two. Let, what, what second thing I want to try to do with this message let, is help us to identify what good works are in Christ. Okay, now um, before you tune out, it's uh, Scripture seems to indicate that it's not actually that easy to know what good works are. Let me just read you a couple verses. I didn't put the reference for this one. I think it's in Corinthians. He says, therefore, do not become partners with them. For or maybe it's Ephesians. For at one time you were darkness, and now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And then this is the verse I really want you to listen to. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Right? He's saying it's going to take some effort. Try to figure that out. That's worthy of some energy. Or Hebrews 5.14 says, Solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Okay? I think what these scriptures are indicating is knowing what's good is not so easy as thinking back to your kindergarten classroom and trying to imagine that list of rules that your teacher put on the wall. You know, don't hit, don't steal, be nice, share stuff, right? It might actually take a little more effort to know what a good work is. And I think that Jesus is helping us here in the Sermon on the Mount to know what it is. It's not just what we do outwardly, but it's actually what we do, uh, you know, it's, it's actually the good works that are arising from a certain kind of heart that he is pleased with. This is why he's telling us to beware, be wary, be watchful of practicing our righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. When he says that word beware, he's saying this is a very easy temptation to fall into. Be wary of it. Be watchful. He's putting up a caution sign saying this is dangerous. You're not better than this. You're not stronger than this. You could easily fall into this. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've been going along and then I look back a week later and I look at that, that last week of good works that I've done and I just realize I've just been walking completely in my pride and flesh. I've just been so eager for people to notice me and see me and praise me. And I had no idea that whole week, right? I was just, I was just blind to it. 
our hearts and our flesh are so subtle, they're so good at deceiving us that Jesus is saying, you need to be wary of this. And the best way that you can know that your good deeds are really flowing from faith and love of God and, and, and only for your uh, treasure that's in heaven is to do them where nobody's watching and nobody else can know. We are so self-deceptive that the best way to ensure you store up treasure in heaven and that you're not just doing it in the pride of in your heart is to not give that any opportunity at all, which means for no one to ever know you did that good work. There should be good works that you take to heaven that nobody knew about, that it's a surprise when we get to heaven. Oh, you did that? If you find yourself constantly telling people about the good things that you're doing, if you find yourself, you're just not able to help it, like you don't want to say it, but you're sitting in there, you're sitting, you're eating a meal and you did this thing and you're, you know, you kind of want them to know and then, oh, you'll, you just tell them. If you find yourself constantly doing that, I think you should take this warning of Christ to heart and he's not saying you're especially sinful. He's just saying you're making a bad deal. He's just saying, logically, you're giving up more reward than you're keeping there. You're getting some praise from that person right now, and you're sacrificing praise for all of eternity. He's saying it's just a logically bad deal. Don't do it. A good work is something that arises from faith and love for God. I think this is why 1 Corinthians 13 says, if I can give up all I have to the poor and give up my body to be burned, but if I have love, I gain nothing. In other words, if I don't have love, that's not a good work at all. I don't, I don't gain anything eternally. A good work is something that flows from a heart of faith and love for God and for neighbor. What this means is that it is, it is also a good work to do something for the reward in heaven, okay? That's a question I get asked quite a bit. If I'm just doing it to get a reward in heaven, is it still a good work? You know what I'm saying? If, if I give you the cold cup of water just because I really want that treasure in heaven, is that good or is that selfish? I think we have to say because of Christ's teaching, that's a good work. Jesus everywhere is trying to use that motivation to try to get us to do good things. Why is that good? Why is that not selfish? Well, I, I think it pleases God because it's something that arises from faith. It arises from faith in heaven and faith in God's goodness to reward and faith in his written word, right? I think it is, in a sense, faith working itself out in love. And so it is a good work when it's motivated by love. It is a good work, even if it's just to receive reward in heaven. You don't need to feel guilty about that at all. You don't need to feel guilty about that even a little bit. And, and what that means is probably we're going to be surprised when we get to heaven. Probably at who's near and far at the throne, okay? This is what I think Paul's trying to get us to do. He's, he, he, he doesn't want us to even try to figure it out necessarily, who's gonna be close and far before we get there. First Corinthians 4, 5, he says, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Or again in 1 Corinthians 3.12, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So what does this mean? This means you might be tempted to look at a guy like me who stands at a podium and opens the Bible and teaches it, and you might be tempted to think that I'm especially godly. You might be tempted to think that I'll be near to the throne in heaven or something like that. And, and what Paul's saying here is you actually don't know my heart. Like for all you know, I am just raging with pride up here puffed up with self, and I'm gonna shipwreck my life and my family and my church, and the day will disclose that. You actually don't know that, right? And the person that's sitting out there that's most meek, most mild, most quiet, doesn't talk about themselves, doesn't seem to have much to offer to the church, doesn't you know, seem like they have these incredible gifts of speaking or teaching or anything like that that's really visible, they might be laboring in the prayer closet and nobody knows it, hours a day. And we get to heaven and I'm farthest at the back. All my good works are burned up. And they're right there near the throne, glorifying God with more joy and full of glory than I ever could hope to be. 
right? That, that's totally possible. And so can I, just, like, can I just try to encourage those of you that feel like you don't have much to offer? Like you're not that attractive, okay? You don't, you don't feel like you have that many skills or gifts or abilities. Okay, can I just encourage you for a second that what this teaching means is that Jesus might be more pleased with you using the gifts that you have from a pure heart, full of love, even if it accomplishes less visible fruit in the world, he might be more pleased with you than that megachurch pastor who's been bestowed with all kinds of gifts and yet uses them for himself or uses them for the wrong meaning or, or really with the gifts he's given should have borne even more fruit. He might be more pleased with the one than the other and the day will disclose that. That should give you profound hope not to judge before the time, right? The example I always use is if you've got two men, okay? And let's say from the outside, you look at them, uh, both of them drank alcohol until they were 30 and then both of them stopped and didn't drink another drop till the day they died. Who is God more pleased with? Well, we don't know. Let's say we get to heaven and we find out one of them was an alcoholic. He had alcoholism raging in his family. It it destroyed many people. And he said, I'm gonna cut this out of my life. The other person was just like, you know, this is silly. I don't wanna spend any more money on this. I'm just not gonna do this anymore. For one, every single day was a massive battle. Massive battle not to grab the bottle. Took all of their energy, all of their effort, all of their strength. And when they get to heaven, that'll be disclosed. And I think God will be more pleased with the one than the other. For some of you, I don't know why, in God's providence, he's given less assurance. He's given less faith. He's given less clarity, less light to the things of the gospel. And you feel like every day you've got to cling to these promises with everything you've got. And there's a windstorm trying to blow you off of the ship. And it's all you can do to cling to the promises of God. And you feel like you bear very little fruit, but all you're doing is closing your eyes and grabbing on and believing in Jesus. And when you die, it's possible that God will be much more pleased with you than a man that's just been given great amounts of faith. It's possible, okay? And yet didn't use that faith the way they ought to have. That's that's possible. That's what he means here when he says, don't judge before the time. Don't judge based on the outward works alone, okay? Now, it works the other way too. If you're weak and use your weakness as an excuse to not bear any fruit, to not try at all, I'm just weak and so I'm not gonna do anything. God says you're a wicked and lazy servant. He'll take what you have and he'll give it to the one who has more. And so the point is, whatever you've been given, Whatever amount of gifting or faith or whatever it is, whatever you've been given, uh, don't judge before the time comes, but rather with uh, whatever faith you've been given, with sincerity of heart, take the gifts you've been given and go to God with your mind in heaven and invest your life for the kingdom of God. And you might be surprised at the reward that you receive there. And then the second thing I think that Jesus teaches us how, uh, about what a good work is and how to store up great treasure in heaven is that the least among us will be first. Jesus seems to teach that greatness in heaven is gained by the servant. He says, it shall not be so among you, but whoever will be great among you must be your servant and whoever will be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The person that will have most treasure in heaven in the long run. I think it's good for you to aim for that. It's good for you to want that. And how do you get there? You get there by actually caring about the treasure of your neighbors. You get there by not only caring about your treasure in heaven, but you get there by saying, I'm saved, this is a miracle. I can't believe God's had such mercy on me. I can't believe God loves me. I can't believe he's done so much for me. I have enough. I'm gonna do everything I can for those around me. I'm gonna pour my life out for my neighbor. I'm gonna pour my life out that this person will be more mature in the faith. Whatever gifts God's given me, I'm gonna use my life to bless them so that they'll have more treasure. I'm gonna be a servant to them to increase their faith, to get them to heaven, so to speak. It's God that does all of this. And Jesus says, when you do that, That's the person that'll be the greatest in heaven. That's the person, the person that lays down their life to serve will be the greatest in glory. Okay, how much time? Where am I at time-wise? Okay, we got a little bit of time. Let me me give another clarification. John, if we're having different degrees of glory in heaven, that means, in a sense, we have different degrees of happiness, Doesn't that, in a sense, mean that I'll be less happy that I don't have more glory and so my happiness is not perfected? 
Okay, did that make sense? Was that too convoluted? Are you tracking? If, there's, uh, if, if it's not all egalitarian in heaven, if it's not equal in heaven, okay, then won't I be disappointed that I don't have more? And won't that disappointment be a kind of sorrow that God says that won't be in heaven? There's no more sorrow, okay? Or John, what about that story where God calls people to work in the field, right? And he works all day and he only gets one mina. And he works just in the last hour and he also gets one mina. Doesn't it seem like everybody gets the same? So glad you asked. Let me, let me just read. This is again, this is Jonathan Edwards. I, I read a sermon by him, but preparing for this on this whole topic, and it was just amazing. So if you want that, I'll send it to you. But let me just read this quote. The answer is no. You, you won't be less happy And the reason the answer is no, I'm gonna try to summarize it and then I'll read it. The reason the answer is no is because heaven will be a a place of perfect love and love does not envy. Which means when you're there, you'll see those people that are farther ahead and deeper in glory like Wesley and Whitfield and you'll actually be happy that they have more glory because you know they deserve it. Like, is there anybody in your life that God has used and has just been profoundly useful in your life? Like God's just used them somehow and how they've shown you what a godly life is or how they've taught you the scriptures or something like that. And you're just profoundly thankful to them for their godliness and their commitment to the scripture and how they've taught it. Aren't you just wanting them to have more glory? Aren't you saying, man, they deserve it. You need to go farther ahead, man. Yeah, you pass me in the line. I'm not disappointed in the least. I want you to have more glory because I love you and you deserve it and it's fitting and right and true. And I'm just happy to be here, man. You know what I'm saying? That's what it'll be like. The image that Jonathan Edwards uses, and I'm gonna read it, so maybe I shouldn't say it, is, is that we're all cups, so to speak, in heaven, and we're all thrown into the ocean of God's glory, and we're all filled perfectly with his glory, and yet different cups have different sizes. They have different capabilities of receiving that glory and being filled with that glory. So we're all perfectly filled. We're all perfectly happy. In that sense, we all get paid the same thing. We're all there. And yet there's different sizes of, uh, of cups that are able to hold more glory and more happiness in heaven. Let me just read the quote now. He says, Christ tells us that he who gives a cup of cold water to a disciple in the name of a disciple shall in no wise lose his reward. But this could not be true if a person should have no greater reward for doing many good works than if he did but few. It will be no hindrance to the happiness, excuse me, of those who have lower degrees of happiness and glory that there are others advanced in glory above them. For all shall be perfectly happy. Everyone shall be perfectly satisfied. Every vessel that is cast into this ocean of happiness is full. Though there are some vessels far larger than others, and there shall be no such thing as envy in heaven, but perfect love shall reign throughout the whole society." Does that make sense? So no, you won't be disappointed because it's a land of perfect love and perfect humility and you'll want other people to have more glory because love does not envy, okay? So now let me close here just by trying to stir you up and motivate you to store up treasure in heaven. I think that's what our Lord is doing here in the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking this way and he's trying to exhort them, don't lay up treasure for yourself on earth where moth and rust destroy. You know, um, people say that you can't take your stuff with you. Have you heard that phrase, right? And that's true. That's It's really biblical, right? You're gonna have to give your money to another generation and who knows what they're gonna do with it, right? But there is uh, something that you can take to heaven with you. This is Revelation 4.13. He says, their works do follow them. (coughs) Revelation 4.13 says, the godly die and go to heaven and their works do follow them. What does he mean? It means they follow you and that book is open and you receive treasure. How many people in this world are willing to live and work and labor for 50 years, eight hours a day, maybe more, 10 hours a day to pad that retirement fund so that for the last 10 years of their life, if they get that, maybe, they can do things they wanna do. They can go travel where they want to travel. They can eat the food they want, to food they want to eat. How many people live that way? Millions upon millions upon millions live that way. They'll labor for 60 or more years in order to celebrate and live it up for 10 or less years of their life. And that's just shockingly dumb. That's what Jesus is saying here, shockingly dumb. You don't know if what you're storing up there is even going to stay. 
and then it's not gonna last, you're gonna die, and it's all gonna be gone. But what's Jesus saying? There's a kind of investment that you can make that won't just last 10 years and is perfectly safe and is coming from an incredibly generous God that will last for all of eternity. It's just a matter of logic, right? Like I'm not even trying to make a real spiritual thing here, right? It doesn't even take that much faith. It's just logic. If this is true, that I can store up treasure in heaven that will last for eternity, I'd be insane to choose to store up treasure on earth that maybe will last me 10 years. It's just illogical. That's what Jesus is saying. And so the way that you're gonna do this is you need to remember that you are going to die very soon. Like your life is short. One of the things I always try to remind myself of, okay, is that, um, you know, I think the average lifespan in America is like in their seven, in your 70s, something like that. I'm 31, which means I'm basically, I'm pretty close to being halfway done. I've lived half my life. If you're 20, a lot of you guys are 20 in here. If by reason of strength, you're able to live to be 80, you're a quarter of the way done, right? Like what you just did, think about your life back, think, think about all the years you've gone through, okay? You get to do that three more times, maybe, and then you die, right? Guys, death is coming. It's here, it's soon, it's, it's bearing down on us. What are you going to live for? You need to make this decision to store up treasure in heaven now. Just like your investors will tell you, you need to start storing up in your 401k now. You know, you need to start, uh, you know, store up, you know, get a retirement. I'm not saying that's wrong, okay? I have a retirement account. But more importantly, what I wanna do is I, I wanna store up in heaven, right? One of the things, you can pull up that slide. Um, you can pull up that slide, JT. One of the things that people used to understand better than us is, is that death was coming. Have you ever wondered why in all these Renaissance pictures, can we dim the lights? Is that possible? Why in all these Renaissance pictures, have you ever wondered why there's a skull there? Like, do these guys just really love Halloween? You know, are they just weirdos? Like, why are there always skulls? Skull, skull. Like, these are supposed to be godly people. I think that last guy was St. Paul. That's a saint. This is just the whole painting is a skull, skull. What the heck is going on with these guys? Do they love death? All right, why do they do that? Okay, you can turn the lights back on. Thank you. This is everywhere. You go study Renaissance art, you're just gonna find skulls everywhere that you find somebody that they considered wise in their painting. Why is that? Well, they had this phrase, it was called memento mori. Memento mori, and what it means is remember death. They're saying in that painting that part of the reason why those men were so wise and able to accomplish so much is they had a skull sitting on their desk to remind themselves, I'm gonna die and that's gonna be me really soon. Really soon. That's why they did it. God's word tells us, Lord, teach me to number my days that I might gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, understand you're probably not gonna live very much longer. And if you do that, if you realize that this life is short and eternity is, wrong, is long, then all of these big decisions in your life, they start to get a little more perspective, right? Like who you marry is actually much less important than the fact that you live for God's glory, whoever it is that you marry, and you store up treasure in heaven forever. Your marriage is a blink, right? What job you do matters much less than the fact that you do that job to God's glory because you're gonna be in heaven forever giving account for what you did in that job. Where you live actually matters very little in scheme of it all. What really matters is that wherever you live, you live for God's glory, storing up treasure for yourself in heaven. If you have faith to believe God's word, it's the only logical way to live. And so my exhortation to you is to believe this promise. Jesus says, you will be rewarded. You will be. It's, it's take it to the bank. It's a promise. It's from our Lord. He cannot lie. Therefore, let me just close with this exhortation to you. Campus Fellowship, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I just wanna exhort you guys to live for the kingdom of God. You will not regret it eternally, but I think you will regret living for this world eternally. Okay, let's pray.